Herefordshire has long been home to travellers. It's farming country, and farms need workers. So the travellers don't necessarily travel very far. They travel from farm to farm. They go where they're needed. And until quite recently, Gypsy Vardos and the more modern trailers, they were just as much part of the landscape as the farm barns and all the orchards. Chris Smith grew up on the Rolls Royce of trailers. It was a vicar's, his mother's pride and joy. And she knew very well what some of the settled folk thought about her kind. And she would invite them in with a defiant tilt to her chin and watch as their mouths dropped open when they saw the beautiful Axminster carpet, the gleaming crown derby crockery and the display cabinets, and everywhere bathed in the smell of the beeswax that she used to polish the leather bunks. Chris was the youngest of a large family, so the closest in age to him when he was growing up was Jenny, who was actually his niece. But Chris and Jenny, well, they roamed all over together, and their favourite place was to go down by the river, the Frummy. You might know it as the Froom, but to them and the people in Yarkill where they lived, it was always the Frummy. There was one day, one golden day after weeks and weeks of grey, that Chris and Jenny were on their way to catch the bus for school. And Chris suddenly grabbed Jenny's elbow and said, let's not go, just for today. And quick as a flash, the two of them were over a gate, hiding down behind the hedge, just as the school bus came round the corner. And slowed down, stopped, but with no sign of them, it soon started up and was away again. And they were free, the whole day ahead of them. Of course, they went to their favourite place, they went down to the river from me. And they made their way down the steps under the bridge, they paddled out in the shallow waters underneath the bridge and then hauled themselves up onto their favourite rock. Just the perfect size for the two of them to sit side by side and fish with their homemade fishing rods. What's that? said Jenny. Where? said Chris. And he looked. There was something glinting underneath the water, a gold bracelet. Treasure. Well, they knew the stories of the river, and they knew that the river from me it let out into the river Lug, and the Lug was full of all kinds of creatures that loved treasure. Where the Lug and the Y met, that's where the dragon used to go to drink, and everybody knows that every dragon has a hoard. Further up the Lug, that's where the mermaid was, and she loved gleaming, glimmering things. She even saw the church bell once. It was a great storm. And the church tower at Marden, all the bells were clanging and ringing and clanging. And the storm was so great, it blew one of those bells right out of the tower till it landed on the ground, rolled into the river. The mermaid came up, grabbed it, took it down into the water. Well, when the storm was over, everybody came down and they tied ropes around the bell, attached them to the horses, tried to heave up the bell. But the mermaid was holding the other end. It was stuck fast. The old henwife came down, peered into the water, looked at them. You can do it, she said, but you'll need 12 white heifers with you yokes and rowan bands. And when you lift a bell, you must do it in silence. No one must say a word. And then, and only then, you stand a chance. They did what she said. At last, the 12 white heifers were gathered, yoked with you, and the rowan bands attached on to the, the great bell. And they began to coax that bell up and up out of the water. And as it came to the surface, it glided to the river bank. And as it nudged the bank, it tilted to show a mermaid nestled inside. <gasps> we've not only got the bell, we've got the mermaid as well, said one of the drivers, unable to hold his mouth shut anymore. And of course, the mermaid woke up. And she glared at them. If it was not for your rowan and your you, I'd have had all those 12 white heifers too. She grabbed hold of the bell, pulled it down into the water, and that was the end of that. Chris and Jenny looked at that glimmering gold bracelet. Their fishing mods were made of rowan. 
Without a word, they slipped down into the water and they paddled to the edge of the ledge before the water got deeper. And they reached out, stretching out with those row and fishing rods, trying to hook onto the end of the bracelet. A little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further. But every time they touched it, it seemed to nudge the bracelet deeper. Jenny reached out as far as she could and Chris saw the telltale whirl in the water and Eddie pulling downwards. Stop, he said, grabbing Jenny's elbow, pulling her back. Just as the bracelet was caught in the eddy and dragged down. You spoke, accused Jenny. You were about to fall in, said Chris. They looked where the bracelet had been. It wasn't meant to be theirs. They looked downstream and thought of the dragon further down, twitching its tail, making the eddy to pull its treasure back to it. The bracelet was gone, and the sun and the afternoon seemed faded. But Chris, he took that memory and he packed it away safe. And every now and then he would take it out, polish up the magic and the brightness until it shone just like his mother's leather bunk.